Hi there and welcome to this video. This video supplements the Dry Stack Construction Handbook. Information fully described in this book is further demonstrated through this video. Although this video was created in 2006 with lesser technology, the accuracy of the information still holds. So let's get this video on the road. Hello and welcome to our dry stack block video series. As you can see from the introductory video, the house walls are completed and now we're going to demonstrate how to build the attached garage walls. On this house plan, the major house is completed, all the solid black walls are finished. What we're going to do is work on the garage in the corner here. The original plans called for a carport. We later decided that a carport would just collect leaves and we decided to make an enclosed garage. So this video will explain how to build the walls that form this garage. This way you have a complete understanding of the wall construction from the very beginning of formed footers all the way up to the finished rebar and the lintels awaiting concrete bond beam. Here we have a bird's eye view of the forms which will form up the footer. Uh, the camera lens distorts this picture and makes things look out of square. The corner of the garage really is square and the walls on the house really are not sloping. The camera lens just causes this effect. Notice the L's laying on top of the forms. That is the rebar that goes down inside the footer when the footer concrete is poured. After you pour the concrete, you insert this L bar down into the white mark on the L. On the L. That sets the proper depth of the L into the concrete. And these rebar will attach to the wall cell rebars later and makes a very solid wall structure. This is a closer view of the footer forms. Notice how that there are two rebar in the bottom of the footer. They sit on things called chairs. These little wire chairs hold the rebar two and a half inches above the soil. This allows the concrete to fully envelop around the rebar and makes the rebar become an integral portion of the concrete. This rebar, by the way, is what keeps foundations from cracking. And that's fully explained in the book. Throughout this video, you'll hear me reference the term SBC. This stands for Surface Bonding Cement. It was originally designed for cities to use in concrete water tanks to store huge quantities of water. This picture shows the front of the garage with the walls stacked halfway up and with no SBC applied at this time. This picture shows the garage with the SBC coating applied. And the SBC gives the garage a very pleasing and very professional look. 
We use it here to bond all the concrete blocks into one integral unit. It's usually sprayed on and then troweled to the desired finish. And when you spray it on, it fills all the little voids and cracks between the blocks, little gaps and nicks and corners broken off of blocks. It fills that all in and makes one solid wall surface. It's applied to both the inside of the wall and the outside of the wall. This picture has stucco showing in three different states. The bottom of the picture is a stucco after it's cured. It's white in color. The top of the picture is stucco that's been recently sprayed and been troweled smooth. And the middle of the picture shows a stucco, which they call it knockdown. It needs to be knocked down and made smooth. This hasn't been troweled yet. This is the way the stucco looks when it's been sprayed on the wall. The knockdown is trial to make the surface flat. You may not want a smooth surface, but you want a flat surface. So you trial it flat, and then you trial in your pattern if you want a pattern, or you make it smooth if you want a smooth result. The SBC has millions of tiny fibers, which generate the strength of this surface bonding process. This fiber reinforced SBC also provides missile penetration protection during severe storms and severe weather. Here is another picture of the house awaiting the attached garage addition. We're now looking at the footer where it joins up against the house on the left side of the garage door. This is the outside wall of the garage. Notice the rebar sticking up out of the footer. And this is the person door on the other end of the garage. These rebar that are sticking up don't always fall vertical and plumb when you put them in the concrete, but that's okay because after the concrete is set for a couple of days, then you can bend the rebar to make them vertical. Don't try to bend them during the first day because they'll, they'll wobble, wobble out the hole in the concrete and won't be nearly as strong. Once the forms are removed, it's best to re-level the, the ground around the work area. That way you're working on a nice flat surface instead of some uneven surface which could actually sprain your ankle. So this is one last look at the cleaned footers ready to start the wall stacking process. Here we have a little ridge in the top of the footer. And since the footer is only a couple of days old, it's easy to take a 3 inch chisel and knock this ridge off. It's best to smooth out the footer as much as you can. That way you start with a smoother surface. It's easier to mortar the blocks and you end up with a better result. If you were to wait a month before you tried to knock this ridge off, the 3 inch chisel just wouldn't do the job. It would be far too hard. So now you can see the before and after of leveling the little ripple on the foundation. These are the tools I use to level to clean the blocks. The blocks have a dirty edge on the bottom side of the blocks, and when you place them in a mortar it doesn't matter. But when we're stacking blocks, these ragged edges cause problems. So I like to clean them so we have a nice smooth edge. Here's a picture of a block that's been cleaned. The hump in the, is always in the middle of each web. Hopefully your blocks will be of better quality. Notice that the air chisel makes quick work of any any bumps in the block, big pieces. And then you take the three inch hand chisel and just run it across the surface. That knocks off any little slag imperfections from the mold. You end up with a very flat surface on the block, and this is the bottom side of the block. Notice how imperfect the foundation is here, with different gap spaces underneath the block. This is why you have to mortar the first row to get everything back normal. When people pour foundations, they do not do exacting work. And here's some voids in the edge of the concrete. In this video clip, we're looking at a test placement of the first row of blocks. When you're uncertain about a wall segment, you might want to go ahead and drop the blocks in place and see how everything works out. Remember, the second row has to work out too, not just the first row. So make sure you always, if you're really concerned, you should stack the first two rows as a test case before you start mortaring. This cheap table saw is what I use with the diamond blade cutting blade to cut the blocks. I cut my own inspection blocks. I would not have to bother with special ordering. 
and the pieces away in here are six pieces out of six inspection blocks that make it out of regular full length concrete blocks. Let's talk about these house walls for a moment. The sun is nearly high noon and it causes deep shadows to be cast. So when you look at this house corner here, it looks like the third row up looks like the blocks are really out of alignment. And there's a deep shadow just below the third block. And it's really not that bad out of alignment. The alignment's off about a sixteenth of an inch. And the SBC is at least an eighth of an inch thick. So we're going to cover this slight misalignment. I just want you to know that the sun shadows make everything look really extreme. You will also notice that several of these blocks have extreme gaps between them. And uh, this is the result of the blocks being different height. When I did the first six rows of the house, I didn't understand about blocks being up to a quarter of an inch different in height, but they are. So these blocks were not sorted by height, therefore there's all these little gaps. Notice how this wall looks good overall. This is because all these blocks have been sorted by height and there's no difference in, difference in height between adjacent blocks. The exception is this half block on the right hand side of the picture. This half block is a sixteenth of an inch taller than the whole block next to it. Notice how it kicked up the block above it. So you do not want different sized blocks in a wall. You can have different sized blocks as long as each row has the same size blocks. Never mix block sizes within the same row. Otherwise you get these gaps. And it also makes bobbles in the wall. And the wall becomes unlevel up and down. When you apply the SBC, it will fill these slight voids, these slight gaps, and make a structurally sound wall plane on the outside of the wall. Same way with the inside of the wall. Any gaps are filled by the SBC, so they're not to be of any great concern. I point this out because the wall can look real ragged in one picture and real smooth in another picture. The only difference is the shadowing effects of the sun. These two stacked blocks form the hook for the string line. It leans against the house and notice the string line has a nail behind it to keep it one eighth of an inch from the wall of the house. This spacing keeps the blocks from touching the string as you place the blocks. The stack of blocks at the other end of the string line are for hooking the string line and supporting it. This stack of six blocks securely holds this end of the string line. This is called a mason's block. You set the string so it's six inches too short, you wrap the string around the block, and then you pull the block tight and hook it on the concrete block. This supports that end of the string line. Now we have a string under tension which forms a nice straight string line. And this line will be the reference to place the first row of blocks. It will set the height and the straightness of the row of blocks. This is the left side of the garage door where it attaches to the house. Once again we use two stacked blocks to support the string and a nail to push the string out an eighth of an inch. So this line will set the reference point for this end of the garage wall. This string continues across the garage door opening and sets the right hand side of the garage door opening. This string is also connected to a stack of six blocks and these blocks also connect to the wooden mason's block to hold the string in place. Where the two strings cross, that is the corner of the garage corner. So we can adjust this corner up or down, left or right, by moving the strings and set the corner exactly where it's supposed to be. Now you check down the length of the string to make sure that none of the blocks are equal to or higher than the string. Ideally, ideally you want the block at least a quarter of an inch below the string. That way you have room to place the mortar underneath the block. If you should find yourself in a situation where the space is not a quarter of an inch below the string, the top of the block, then what you may want to do is raise the entire string on both walls a quarter of an inch. It's much more important to have a nice straight and flat mortared first row than to have the first row the exact height of the wall. If the height of the wall is off of a quarter inch, the trusses really won't notice that over a span of 34 feet. So it's better to have it flat than have it the right height. At this time we have placed and mortared the first row on the left side of the garage door. 
notice that the string has been slacked off. I slack the string whenever possible to keep from stretching the string. That way the next time you put the string back on the hook it's, strong, it's tight again. The spacing between these two blocks was on purpose. We want to be able to set the garage door opening exactly where we want it and set the outside corner of the garage wall exactly where we want it. The spacing provides for the necessary adjustment. When you strike this block, just continue right across the inspection hole opening as if it didn't even exist. Uh, when you strike the block, make sure you don't have any mortar where the next block has to place and butt up against this block. And last but not least, we have the final people door opening block which is placed in line with the people door opening. Extra effort was taken to ensure a nice clean junction between the block wall and the footer. This people doorway here will have the garage slab protrude out through it. The garage top of the garage slab will be four inches below the bottom of the block row. When the door is installed, the door sill will set right here and will have a nice fit between the house wall and the end of this garage wall. When you take your time and mortar the first row properly, you have a very nice stable flat platform for stacking the rest of your blocks. The stacking process will go much smoother when you have a nice flat starting point. Here we have the third row stacked up against the house on the right hand side of the garage door. Notice the cutout in the foundation that is for the garage door tracks when the garage door is installed in the future. Next we're going to start sweeping down the people door down the long length of the wall and there's one item I want to look at here and this is this weird block right here in the middle. This closing block was one eighth of an inch too long so it was cut into two pieces and the two pieces are placed back into the closing opening which now fits because the saw curve cut through the block made it an eighth of an inch shorter. You can also make a second pass down one of the block pieces to make that block piece even shorter if required. This picture was taken after the wall cell was filled with concrete, therefore the inspection block hole was filled with concrete. As we continue on down the garage outside wall, we eventually come to the corner section down here. Notice in the footer here that we have fixed the voids in the footer with mortar. This is a cosmetic issue. The SPC will later cover it and make it strong. So this solves that ugly corner. I stack these top two rows without a string on purpose. I want to demonstrate how the far blocks down their way towards the end of the wall start to curve. Even though I'm stacking them as straight as I can get them, looking at adjacent blocks, the actual wall curves towards the end. This is the same wall after the blocks are adjusted back to a string line. Notice how the distant blocks down there are nice and straight and they line up with the wall at the house on the other side of the people doorway. It's imperative that you use a string line on each row that you stack otherwise it, the wall makes a gentle curve which you don't notice but when you're finished you have a big bow at the top of the wall and that's unacceptable. Here we're going to discuss a defect in this wall. This block is lower on the left hand side. It's lower by a good eighth of an inch and I think it settled after it was placed. This block, the other end of the block, is like a sixteenth of an inch lower. So this low block is going to cause problems throughout the rest of the wall. Because this block is low, it lets the block above it drop down. The left side kicks up, pushes the third row block up. Notice we have a different spacing between the blocks in the third row. So this is what's called a bobble. It's all because this one block is out of position in height. At this location the bobble doesn't matter because I'm going to pour a concrete window sill right here. And the window sill will camouflage the bobble. But if you're going to have a wall going all the way up, you probably need to fix this bobble. Uh, what you'd have to do is shim the short block here. By placing shims under this block, that would raise up the block above it, bring it back up to level, and that would let the third row block drop back down where it belongs, and this bobble would be gone. This problem became obvious when I placed a third row of blocks, but I simply ignored the problem because I knew that the window location would mask the problem and it did not have to be fixed. This is how I attach the string to the house wall. 
This wooden prop has a nail, and the chain hooks over the nail so it doesn't slide down the wood. I can adjust the length of the chain to get the block so it doesn't touch the wall and doesn't touch the wood. And then the bottom block keeps the prop from kicking out on the loose sand. So this way I can set the string any place on the wall that I want it with ease. This is an example of an out of plane block. If you notice that the crack along the wall here, there's an edge at the top I can hook my finger on it. That's because the block is not vertical. The top of the block measures one third of a bubble with the outside higher than the inside. This is the same block after it was reversed 180 degrees. Notice how now the side is flush and the level on top shows that it's level. In fact, the level reads one-tenth of a bubble from being level. And one-tenth of a bubble is a good working range. There's no perfection in the building industry. And this is no exception. One-tenth of a bubble is more than adequate. This means that the block below it was probably a tenth of a bubble off in the opposite direction. And when we reversed the block, the block air canceled and became tenths of the bubble in the other direction. This shows one of the number five rebar pins that's been pinned into the corner of the house. This pin will protrude into the next block I stack and interlock the block to the corner of the house. You have to do this when you don't have a running bond pattern in the blocks. Here we have the seventh block stacked and mortared on the left side of the garage door opening. And over here on the right side of the garage door opening we have the seventh row mortared at the corner. We have an eighth block on top of the seventh row just to hold the string line. Notice the string line has a nail that kicks it out one eighth of an inch outside of the block. This is so that when we place blocks in the wall they won't touch the string. The stacked up blocks there in the middle is holding the string line. It just happens to be the exact proper height. However, usually this wouldn't be the case. The string line would not be straight up and down. You would need a string adjusting block such as this one. In this application, I simply stacked the string adjusting block on top of some other blocks, which is setting in the window opening. This allows me to stack the blocks so they won't interfere with the blocks that I want to mortar in place. If you don't have a wall opening, you simply place this block where the closing block would be on that segment of the wall. This wall segment was only 16 feet long. If you had a much longer wall segment, you may need two or three string blocks instead of just one. Once you get the string blocks in position, you can now adjust those string blocks to set your string so that it's true and straight. If you notice the screw screwed into this piece of wood here, we simply loosen the clamp, move the clamp up and down to set the string height in the middle, and then we can move the entire block in or out on the wall to set the string so it's lined up with the length of the wall. So in this manner we can set the height and straightness of the string. Now when you sight down this string you'll notice that the clamp bridges the string so it doesn't touch the string. So just the screw in the block of wood sets the string so that it's straight both vertically and horizontally. The string prop is required to prevent sagging of the string. The longer the string, the more sag. Here we have another view looking down the length of the string. The closer you can get to the end of the string, the more accurate your eye can pick up any deflections, either up and down or left and right. Now that the string has properly been set, it will be the guide for placing the seventh row of mortared blocks. The mud is part science and part art. The first step is to get the top of the mud flattened off. This gives you a nice smooth surface. When you slice on a small section, it will have a fairly uniform width. A uniform width is what allows you to achieve a uniform thickness when you place it on the wall. When you place this uniform width on the wall and you drop a block on top of it, then it squishes to a uniform thickness under that block, and that's the goal. Placement of the mortar improves with practice. Here I'm dropping the first mortar under the wall. I got a little bit too far inside on the edge, so I, there's nothing to wipe off on the outside. If it was too far on the outside, I could push it back on by stroking down the corner of the block. 
So as you continue to place mud, you want to try to keep it uniform width, uniform height, down the length of the next block. And it's an inexact science, so nothing's perfect. You just approximate and hope for the best. Once you get towards the end, then there's a closing crossover there. I like to put mud on a closing crossover. That makes the end of the block more stable. It has less chance of settling down at a later time after you've already positioned the height of the block. At this time, I'll go fetch the block. First, I have to put on my gloves. Then I'll walk over and grab the block and come back and place the block. At this time, the block is coming up and dropping down on the wall. I want you to notice that you touch it, the block against the previous block and you drop it straight down on the wall. Well, this block plays fairly well. It's a quarter of an inch high and it's pretty much parallel with the string. It's parallel across the wall. So it takes very few taps to bring this block to the correct height. You can always align across the wall level of the block with the previous block because that's already been leveled previously. So once you do the cross the wall level against the previous block, then you set your down the wall level with the four foot level. And then once you get everything real close, then you fine check by doing cross the wall with the level and do fine adjustments on the length of the wall with the four foot level. Here this corner, right hand corner is just a hair high. So you tap it lightly, bring it down to the level, touches the surface of the previous block and the current block. Now I go and sight down the outside of the block to make sure it's lined up with the line and that block is now properly placed. In the next sequence I grab the right end of the block and I should have grabbed the left end of the block. In a moment or two you'll see why. While placing this block we're going to demonstrate how you can hold one end of the block. If you grab one end of the block such as the right end here and tap on the left end then the right end won't settle nearly as much as the left end does. It will settle somewhat, but it reduces the rate of travel. So this is how you control how you want the block to settle. Uh, once you have it set across the wall, then you go ahead and continue to fine adjust the length of the wall adjustment. This particular block is doomed from the very beginning. Notice how severe the angle of the block is with the line. The right end of the block is way too high. And because of that, this block will never set properly. No matter how much I beat on it, I'm going to eventually compress the sand enough that the sand in the mortar won't let the mortar go down any further. And at the same time, the left end of the block is going to keep settling every time I type, tap the right end of the block. So eventually I'm going to read a, reach a point of critical mass here where the left side of the block drops below the previous block where we are right now. And the right end side of the block is still way too high. Here I'm adjusting the in and out adjustment, but the whole thing is just an exercise of futility at this point. This block is wrong. This block needs to be removed and done over. At this point in time, you can keep fooling with the block, but you're just kidding yourself because it will never be right. If you notice in this picture, the left end of the block is an eighth of an inch below the previous block. It settled that much while I was tapping the high right end of this block. So, two options here. We can remove the block and redo it over and do it properly. Or you can say, you know, it's been a long day. I'm tired. I'm lazy. I'm not going to do it over. It's off an eighth on the end. It's only off a sixteenth in the middle. The next block will stack for this one. these two points. It won't stack in the middle here. So, the next block will be only off a sixteenth of an inch on one end if I just let this problem go. So, that's poor rationalization. The correct fix here is to pull the block out and do it over. Just remember that the air in the middle is only half the air on the end. So things aren't really as bad as they look. But why, why build a house and do it in a sloppy manner? So it's time to go ahead and pull this block off and start all over. Once you remove the block you have to scrape off the old mortar. You cannot replace a block on old mortar. What happens the water squishes out and it doesn't make a good bond. So you take your trowel and scrape off the mortar. Notice this mortar is flexible. That means it's plastic is the term they use. So as long as it's plastic you can add water to it and remix it and use it over. 
If it wasn't plastic, you'd have to throw it away at this point. So this mortar is still plastic. I'm going to reuse it. Notice this last piece here is only a quarter of an inch thick. So what I want to do, I want to place thicker mortar on the left hand side of the next block and thinner mortar on the right hand side of the next block. This is because the, this block we're mortaring on top to, you notice it's going up as it goes to the right, to the window opening on the right. So I'm placing thicker mortar in the beginning and thinner mortar on the right hand half of the next block. This will make um, better odds that the block will fall properly and remain fairly level with the line because that's the goal. So one nice thing about this job, if you don't like the results, you just scrape it off and do it again. Perfection is something that's elusive, but if you want to go for it, you always can. And I believe in doing the job right. Do it once, do it right, don't do it over. So at this time we're ready to drop the block back in place again. And I've been told that many mason, masons actually drop the block by just holding the center web with a single hand. This makes the block fall straight down. Of course the masons keep the blocks below their shoulders too. They have scaffolding, I don't have scaffolding. So I don't do it as gracefully as a mason would. But this block fell real close now. Notice it's level across the wall. Just a few taps makes it perfectly level across the wall. And now I can give it a few more minor taps to make it level across the length of the wall. It's real close, just a couple taps here. And you want to get the bottom of the level so that it strikes the previous block and this placed block evenly. That way, this is the fine adjustment for interblock leveling. So one last check across the wall. And notice the string in the back. If you're bumping the string to the level, make sure you push down on the level hard enough to move the string. At this time we're ready to strike the mortar on this wall. The mortar has to be pressed in, which makes it more dense. And since it's more dense, then it's stronger. So you need a striking tool, which is a specially shaped tool, and a bucket of water. And basically you go down the wall here and you press the excess concrete into the groove, compacting the mortar so that it's more dense. The excess you either collect in your hand or let it fall in, the, in your mortar tray, or you just let it fall on the ground and waste it. The choice is yours. Uh, one recommendation, though, you don't use your hands. I'm using my hands here because it's real quick. It's only a couple of minutes. But the, the concrete's very hard on your skin, so you probably should wear pair of gloves if you do a lot of striking in the same day. If you don't wear the gloves, you have to wash your hands with water immediately after you're finished handling the concrete, or your hands will get very raw and very cracky the next day. So you go back and forth until you get all the concrete packed into the groove. And like I said, this makes it more dense. You go back here, I'm filling voids right now. There's a few voids where the mortar wasn't placed properly on the block there for the block didn't squish out completely. So I'm packing moist concrete, moist mortar into those grooves and now I'm doing the small groove for the half block. I'm using the other end of the striking tool for the small groove because it's got a smaller radius. Always pull away from the corner when you're trying to strike a corner because if you pull towards a corner it will actually pull the mortar right out of the crack. So once you get everything filled in, then you go back and you smooth it down one more time. At this point I'm going to scrape off the excess mortar, which develops around the edges. There's a little void right there, but we don't worry about it because the SBC will fill that in later. Then you wet your striking tool and go over the whole thing again. This makes, makes the, con the mortar more dense and it also improves the shape of the strike struck mortar. Uh, then I wipe it off one last time, get rid of any excess. And at this time this mortar joint has been struck. Now you have to go on the other side of the wall and strike the joint on the other side of the wall. 
Okay, next we're going to demonstrate how to fill a gap between two blocks. Uh, basically, you get mortar on your trowel, and you hold the trowel up near the bottom, and you just take the striking tool and push the mortar off of the trowel into the crack. As you do this, you keep raising the trowel and keep pushing more mortar. If you stop and move the trowel, the mortar would just peel right out and roll right out of the crack. So when you get towards the top, then you go ahead and you make sure it's packed tight, you remove the trowel and you strike the tool down and that packs it into the groove. And you place the trowel back up against the wall and continue stuffing the rest of the crack. Like I say, the, the very last part you stuff has to be stuffed very well, and it, or otherwise it will roll out of the crack. So once you've stuffed it properly, then you pull off the excess concrete back onto your trowel and you can throw the trowel back into your mixing tub. The professional masons, they waste more mortar than they use. Since I'm paying for it, I prefer not to waste it. So when do you fill a crack and when you do not fill a crack? My standard is if the crack is less than a quarter of an inch, I do not fill it with mortar. If the crack is greater than a quarter of an inch, then I fill it with mortar. There's two reasons for this rule. The first reason is that less than a quarter of an inch, the SPC will penetrate into the crack and make a very strong joint at that crack. Uh, greater than a quarter of an inch, the SBC tends to sag and not cover the crack completely. So it needs the mortar as a backing so that the SBC can build up on the mortar. Another reason not to mortar all the little cracks is that the excess mortar as shown on this block here weakens the SBC bond to the concrete block. Since the mortar is weaker than a concrete block, it would be better to penetrate the block pores than to penetrate the mortar pores. The day after I mortar a joint, I go back and I use a concrete block stone. It's a stone with a handle. And I scrape off all the excess mortar on the side of the block. This cleans up the block and makes the SBC bonding much stronger. Upon hearing a rustling commotion over in the woods, I went over to find what what was making all the noise. And there I found Mr. Turtle. Mr. Turtle comes through here like twice a year. This time in the spring and also in the fall he passes through. It's about 18 inches long his shell is. Pretty good sized turtle. He's about to run into a problem though. Mr. Turtle, he's a lot like us. Sometimes he takes the wrong path in life and he comes up against an obstacle that he can't get around. So pretty soon he's going to realize that he gets hung up on these twigs here. So just like us, he has to say, okay, let's go to plan B here. This isn't working. So he backs up and goes around the obstacle. So the turtle never gives up. He still gets where he's going, even though he has to go out of his way a little bit. And just the same as a turtle, we can't give up. We always solve whatever problem comes our way, just solve it and keep going on. And Mr. Turtle will be back again in about six months. At this time I've completed mortaring in all the closing blocks for row 7. So now we have a nice straight and flat row 7. This will be the base for the top half of the wall, which will stack up on this nice stable platform. All this work pays big dividends because now there's no bobbles in the walls that go above row 7. And we have better chance of having an excellent result when we're finished. Notice how the mortar joint gets thinner at the right hand side of this picture. That's this row 7 mortar joint. That's because it's half block, one block below. The half block is a sixteenth of an inch taller than the block next to it. Because of this, the, it kicks up the block above it and that closes the gap on the mortar joint on row 7 and makes the uphill slant we see that row 7 mortar has to fix. Because the row 7 half block at the top right hand corner of this picture, it is also too tall, therefore it further aggravates the problem. We end up with a very thin mortar line between row 6 and 7 at this mortar joint. This picture shows the other side of the same window opening. And notice this half block, I've cut it to be exactly the same height as the block beside it. And that allows this particular row to stay nice and flat and level. And this is the solution. What you do is you drop the reference block into your, onto your saw table 
you take a 2x4 and you clamp it with the reference block up against the saw blade and you pull out the reference block, turn on the saw and run a half block through there and it'll match almost exactly. And that that is my solution for fixing these half block problems which result from the half block being just a little bit taller than the rest of the blocks. I found this to be a common problem and this is the easy fix for that problem. This view shows the short garage door wall segment which attaches to the house corner. This short wall segment is stacked 10 blocks high. Notice the pins above it on row 12 there's a pin placed into the house corner. This pin will keep this wall from ever moving across the house corner. And there's a rebar that drops down through both cells of this, this short wall segment. This stacked column of blocks will have two rebars, one in each cell. The left cell ends up over the rebar protruding up from the footer and this one filled with concrete makes a very strong doorway opening for the garage door. The other cell will also be filled with a rebar and concrete. The filled cells make this short wall segment very strong even though it does not have a running bond block pattern. The rebar sticking out at the top corner of the house is an extension of the house bond beam rebar. This rebar will overlap the garage header rebar and when you pour the garage header this will lock the short wall segment with the header snugly against the house. It can no longer pull away from the house because the bond beam rebar in the top will join the house wall and this wall segment. This picture which was taken much later demonstrates how the vertical rebar tie into the horizontal rebar and attaches the top corner of this wall. When the header is poured all this rebar interlocks and the interlocking action makes this corner very solid and this column of stacked blocks will never separate from the wall. This video clip will have um, several issues demonstrated. We're going to dry stack three blocks here. My ladder is a little rickety. I get a lot of uh, amazement from people. How can I work on such a rickety ladder? But I've gotten used to it. The ladder and I move in unison and I've never fallen. And it's also setting on unstable sand, so it makes the ladder very unstable. Notice I placed the first block and it didn't check level across the wall, so I rotate it 180 degrees and voila, what do you know? It checked level across the wall. All these blocks are on a plane a little bit, so basically the row below it is on a plane sloping one way, and then the, row, the next row on top of it has to be on a plane the opposite way to make it come out level again. I have an additional handicap. I've been these blocks have been moved since they came off the original block pallets. If you have the original blocks on the pallets, then the pallets are all similar. In other words, the air is the same on the pallets. And if you look at a block, see now this block it's stacked level, so I don't have to rotate it. If you look at the block on the pallet, the top of it, you'll notice that one side is just slightly thicker than the other side. And that's your reference. So on one row you'd stack the thicker side outside and on the next row you'd stack the thicker side on the inside. In this case all the blocks have been moved away from the house when the house was finished and they got all mixed up. So I have to check each one and I probably have to reverse half of them statistically. If you're coming off the pallet you can pretty much judge which way it has to fall and reduces a lot of this reversing action. This is the third block here going up and uh, it needs reversing also, I believe. Yes, it needs reversing. So that's the process. It, I stack three blocks there. It doesn't take that long. If you take a little bit of care and reverse when it's required, you have a much more stable wall. And this wall will stay plumb vertically. Notice I have a snap string below the row I'm working on. Uh, the string is attached to the corner of the row I'm working on, and the other end isn't to keep it out of my way. That way I can easily just drag the box across there and drop them. I could work from the inside of the wall and achieve the same results. 
In this picture I'm using a dead blow hammer to tighten the last block on that wall segment. I find if you tighten the ends of the wall segments then that makes the segments much more stable. Also I've learned that you really can't do the string alignment on the top row because when you place the next row on top a little bit of vibration will knock them out. So what you do is you string align the row below the top row and when you get to the very top of the little block you just line it up with the block below it and you're finished. So these are little tricks of the trade that I've learned over time which help improve the quality of the final wall product. This roofing felt cut into strips is a concrete stopper. It keeps the bombing concrete from falling down through the rest of the wall. And notice it stops on a block joint. If you had a joint in the middle of a cell, it would push down the two ends of the joining material and blow out the concrete right through the hole. So this is unacceptable. Instead, you bring the next piece of felt up to the block joint that we have solid felt over all the cells. Notice down at the end, I have another overlap. I have to cut this felt back and place a short piece on that last block when I get to that point. Here we're looking down the wall cell hole. Notice how the blocks are misaligned. Also the half blocks have thicker sides on one side and the concrete just fills this void, makes everything very strong. This video clip demonstrates how harmonic vibrations such as gusty wind could bring the wall down when it's unbraced. This little bit of vibration builds up with intensity and eventually the wall will come crumbling down. So a few brace blocks will stop all this, prevent that. Here you can see what I call an extended half block. It's the last block on the second row from the top. What it is, it's a regular full block cut just beyond the center web. So it's like an inch longer than a normal half block. Here's another example where the lintel block was cut as an extended half block. These blocks eliminate the need for a half block and they don't matter because when you pour the header, the header will overlap and lock into these. Notice this header example here. The concrete falls under this extended half block on the top lintel row. And there's another picture coming up shortly which shows another extended half block and how the concrete and the header just goes underneath it. So this is easy to do when you run out of half blocks. Here we've completed the wall by placing the lintel blocks on top. This wall is now ready to add the rebar on each side of each window and on each side of each doorway. This wall needs to be braced in case some strong winds come up during the night. This wall also needs some closing block gaps filled. This is my homemade rebar bender made out of an old trailer hitch and three trailer hitch balls and a piece of pipe. Uh, the book has much more detail and close-up pictures of this design if you want to make your own. Bending rebar is a fact of life if you go to build with concrete blocks, so you must have some way to bend your rebar. Commercial rebar benders and cutters cost around $300, and this cost me about, well, cost me nothing. Everything I had, all the materials I had on hand, and I used a chop saw to cut the lengths. So this was bent as a wall cell header, and I'm going to cut off so there's a 24-inch L at the top. So I'm carrying it over to the chop saw where I'll cut off the L to 24 inches on top. Then the next scene will show actually installation of this piece of rebar. To carry the rebar with one hand you always have to find the center of balance. And that way one hand is easy to manipulate the rebar. So you climb up the ladder when you get to the top of the ladder you have to extend the rebar up high enough to clear the block. So it takes both hands to do this. And then you slide the block, the rebar down through the block Try not to bang the block any more than you have to. And you line the bottom of the rebar with the rebar coming out of the footer. Make sure that's right next to it. And you set the top of the rebar in the center, center of the lintel blocks. And now you can go down and tie the bottom of the rebar to the footer rebar with a piece of wire. The wire tie wire is a special wire, it has a loop on each end. So you basically bend the wire tie in half so you can 
reach in there and wrap it around both rebar. And once you get it around both rebar, you line up the two loop holes and take a special tool that sticks up through both loop holes and you just spin the handle of the tool. You bring it up tight and then you should back it up a half a turn and then tighten it again. Back it up half a turn tighten it a third time. And this makes a nice solid tightness. So that's a special tool. It's a low cost tool but you have to have it. Once it's secured the bottom of the rebar, you go back up to the top and make sure the top is still centered in the lintel cells. And you make sure it's pretty much centered down through the wall cell. And when you actually pour the wall cell, you have to keep an eye on this. Once you get it full of concrete, you make sure that the rebar is still centered and parallel with the lintel blocks. This is a preliminary overview of the wall bracing. Notice the corner doesn't need bracing because the interlocking blocks braces the corner by themselves. I have concrete blocks on the stakes which hold the bottoms of these braces. That keeps vibration from amplifying, reduces harmonics. And I've got spreader spacers between the window brace boards so they can't slip off the wall. There's also a spreader at the doorway brace down there against the house. So this is a quick view of the bracing that I use. It's a good thing I braced the walls last night because we had a storm come through here with 30 to 50 mile per hour gusts which lasted all night long. As you can see the trees moving around the background. It's still real gusty the next morning. This video clip shows the header detail on the right hand side of the garage door. This temporary rebar is tied up to the vertical rebar to hold it in place, hold it in alignment while I pour the concrete. This concrete block hanging on the stake, the mass of the block reduces and dampens out any vibrations that the wall may transmit down to the stake, which is in a sandy soil. So this stabilizes the brace. Once again, you can see how I cut to length these boards, which I hammer, hammer between the two braces so they can't slip off the ends of the walls. Uh, the doorway brace fell out during the night due to the high wind gusts. If you look closely at this picture, you see that there's two wood screws attaching each vertical brace piece to the brace arm. This locks the sides of the walls so they can't be moved. This video section will demonstrate the sequence of pouring concrete into a wall cell using the hopper method. Find them at the top of the wall. And I've got a metal stick I poke down through there. I crack the gate open a couple of inches and I poke the rod down through to get the flow started. I'm dumping into a side chute which goes around the vertical rebar. This picture doesn't show it all very well, but we'll see it later. So the gate controls the rate of flow, and whenever it gets full, and that cell gets full, you just close the gate and move the hopper over to the next cell. Continue. So this is the first step, dump the loaded hopper. Next step is to boom up the boom to bring the hopper back towards the mixer away from the wall. And then simply just lower the hopper straight down and drop it down in front of the mixer. All the time this is going on, there's water in the mixer which has been cleaning the mixer. All the time I've been moving this concrete up to the wall cell. Notice I have the mixer, I have a slide chute on the mixer, and also spare bags of concrete all on the trailer which is pulled by the garden tractor. This makes it real easy to relocate to different cells throughout the building. I found this to be the only solution for a person that works by themselves. Everything has to be portable on wheels. That reduces the effort to relocate it for each cell. Now comes the hard part, you've got to grab the 80-pound bag, hold it close to your chest, which reduces the stress on your lower back. Step up onto the trailer and drop the bag in the bag chute. Notice this chute has a circular saw blade mounted, which rips open the bag, so I just let gravity slide the bag down, and you hold the top of the bag and push the bottom of the bag to make all the cement fall out and into the mixer. Very easy process with this bag chute. While the current batch is mixing in the mixer, I take this opportunity to fill 
the water bucket with the water for the next mix. The water bucket has a mark in it. I fill it up to the mark while the current mix is taking place. And this makes everything efficient. Just make sure you don't inhale any of the concrete dust in the early phases of the mixing action. The concrete dust is very bad. When the water bucket gets filled with the mark, I turn off the mixer and go and shoot the concrete into the hopper. Notice the um, weights on the east side of the pulley on the cable that holds the hopper. These weights make tension on the cable while the hopper sits in its holding area and lets the bar swing down out of the way. Without these weights, the cable would twist around and make a big mess. So now the hopper has been filled and it's time to add the water to the mixer for the next batch. And this way this water cleans out the mixer while I'm taking this batch up into the wall cell. The sequence keeps everything flowing in a uniform and efficient manner. Now I simply let the lift do all the work and I push buttons and the electric motors take the hopper out of the hopper stand Notice the rope tied here on the side of the hopper. That goes to a counterweight on a pulley. The counterweight keeps the hopper from rotating and keeps the wind from blowing it around once it's up in the air. Works quite efficiently with this counterweight. As the hopper is lifted up on the lift winch on the system, when it gets at a certain height, they'll go ahead and start booming down the boom. So two different switches. One switch runs the hopper up and down. Another switch runs the boom up and down. I have a third switch which rotates the boom left and right. So as the hopper gets up in the air, I'll start lowering the boom. You can run the two at the same time. You can be lifting while you're booming down. And you're going to see that right now. It's still lifting and it's booming down simultaneously. If you get good at it, you get so the hopper ends up just about right where you want it. Today I'm being more cautious for this video. This picture demonstrates how the side chute allows the concrete to fall from the hopper and be side chuted over into the cell and wrap around the rebar. This was made out of just plain old sheet metal, just form the shape of the chute and then there's two metal wires at the top of the chute. They tie onto the rebar to hold the chute in place and you just place the hop or hopper over the chute and let the concrete fall down through the chute. The wall cells have all been poured and allowed to cure for a day or two. Then it's time to install the header and the bond beam rebar which is shown here. It's shown in place in this picture. This is the garage side of, I should say the house side of the garage doorway opening. We've seen this picture earlier. It shows how all the bond beam overlaps. It makes a very solid header which is attached firmly to the house due to the bond beam rebar extending out from the house. These rebar overlap 24 inches and when you pour concrete around them they become one unit. This shows the other side of the garage door opening where the bond beam makes a bend and goes around the corner. It also shows the vertical rebar and the side of the garage door opening how it ties into this bond beam rebar. And here we have the braces removed. With the poured cells you no longer need the braces, at least not from my opinion. I've never had a problem with this method. Another close-up detail of the window rebar showing all the rebar interacts. When you pour the header concrete, this is a very solid window opening. Here we have a shot looking down the lintel blocks going towards the house and the people door in the garage. Notice the rebar doesn't have to be straight, it just has to be in there. The concrete will overlap it all and make one integral unit. So at this time the wall is finished. All we need to do now is add the forms, pour the headers, and pour the bond beam. A dry stack block home has many advantages over conventional home construction. There are no expensive forms required, such as when you build with concrete. 
One person can complete most of the work, just one block at a time. You can also stop anytime you feel like it. The home will be very strong and waterproof. Water cannot penetrate these walls. A dry stack block home can keep you comfortable year round while reducing your utility bills due to its thermal mass. There's no drafts to penetrate the home envelope. The dry stack block with the SBC coating makes the walls draft proof. Concrete blocks can be purchased almost anywhere and they're also easily transported to unusual site locations because you can take the one block at a time, one block at a time if you had to. These block walls resist high winds, fire, and insects cannot penetrate these walls. The SBC coated block walls do not promote the growth of molds. There's nothing for the mold to feed on. It also provides excellent soundproofing from outside noise. The best part is that it's easy to design house plans for dry stack block because of the empirical design standards that all building codes already have in place. This tried and proven method of using concrete blocks has been around for decades. These concrete blocks can be stacked to form any shape or size of home that you can imagine. The dry stacked home is a solid investment for your family both in terms of safety and value. During severe weather situations the block is not easily penetrated by flying debris because of the SBC coating. Also the dry stacked block home requires far less work to keep it looking like new. Once again the SBC coating gives you a stucco appearance that's cover fast and at least an eighth of an inch deep and it's impervious to outside damage.